Uh, now we're on to the second part of our workshops. This is my favorite part. This is the kind of the round table where we get to kind of be a little more interactive um, with um, our panelists. So our uh, first panel member is gonna just talk a little about Full Belly Farm is Rye Muller. Um, so uh, he's gonna talk a little about free range eggs and then we're gonna have uh, Ross Shoup speak next. Great, thank you. All right, thanks for... UC Davis for putting this on, and thanks for, for having me this evening. Uh, my name is Rye Muller. Um, I am a second generation farmer from Full Belly Farm, which is uh, located not too far from Davis, about 45 uh, minutes away um, in the Cape Valley. Um, my family has been farming at Full Belly. My parents started about 35 years ago, um, raised myself in my three siblings on the farm um, and they started with a couple other partners in the business and um, where's this the clicker is there is it sorry the down arrow on this one okay there we go um, so yeah uh, we are a diversified about 450 acres now um, when they started it was about a two acre vegetable farm um, but now we are a 450 acre mixed diverse fruit, vegetables, nuts, um, and we have integrated now more recently livestock into the whole production system. Um, so that has kind of been after I started a little chicken project for, with the FFA program in high school, I kind of wanted to bring birds out of the little chicken coop that we had in the backyard um, and, and try to incorporate them into the whole vegetable world, which presents a whole a host of food safety challenges, but uh, also created a product that we, as soon as we got it to the, to the market on our stand, we were able to uh, sell every last egg that we can produce. So. Um, I've really enjoyed the the progression of things. Uh, we're yeah, as I said, a really diverse farm, um, and one of my roles is is managing. We have about twelve hundred layers on the farm, uh, about eighty um, eighty ewes, so about two hundred and fifty sheep that are run through the farm. We have um, a number of uh, a one sow operation, kind of as our recyclers. Um, and a milk cow that's mostly kind of a demonstration, um, personal consumption portion of our, our animals on the farm. So we also have a summer camp uh, that's run through the farm. We do school group visits. Um, and I have to say, as much as kids like would love to go look at broccoli at a farm, animals are really how people connect to a farm. So if you're thinking about starting a farm and, and ever want to bring in like the educational component, animals are really the only way for people, uh, or kids at least, to really get excited about being at the farm. So um, yeah, so I'll kind of try and focus on chickens here because that's why we're here. But uh, as I said, Started in 2008 with our first little mobile coop um, that I put together as a FFA project. Uh, immediately tried tri trialing different breeds of birds to see what would work best in our, our climate, our situation. Um, and probably as, as, as most people, fast forward here to the, to the coops. Um, most people have found, or we found the most suitable bird um, for production reasons, for, um, acclimation to a the, the mobile coop system that we developed uh, was a, a Vega Brown which we fa find right here in Dixon California so we're able to get our chicks uh, uh, an hour old um, with really low mortality rates in our brooder um, so kind of this was the me being young and enthusiastic in high school driving what looks like I was barefoot at that time um, our first uh, prototype out to the field to get the birds out there um, and so, yeah, um, it, the, the business kind of grew from, from there, uh, went, went away to college, did some traveling, um, and found my way back. And, uh, one of my main passions since being back at the farm has been expanding the egg, egg program and, and some of the animal aspects, um, incorporating the animals better to the farm to help improve our soil, um, and provide a really highly marketable, high, high value, um, addition to our offering to our uh, cu customers and CSA members that we have. Um, so some of the initial things that really kind of helped 
us lower our costs um, or, you know, some big investments. Um, but it, when you pencil it all out, you're going to save a ton of money by um, investing in some of these things like bulk containers where you get way reduced uh, uh, costs on all of your feed. Uh, ease of delivery and handling of all these materials. These are just three grain bins that we put up ourselves, um, pour to slab ourselves, and um, immediately, immediately with that little slide gate, you have a really way to manage all of your feed. Uh, we invested in an egg washer, um, a little tractor. This is just a 22 horsepower little Kubota that does every all of our mobile chicken moving. Um, we call it the little donkey, and uh, this little hitch is a great little thing to have on the back because you can just back up to any of the trailers. Um, there, there's no, you don't monkeying around with lifting up trailers, messing with jacks. Um, you can connect to a trailer and go without uh, even really getting off the tractor. Um, these are some of my helpers, my sons, um, that are really fun to egg, wash eggs with in the egg room because um, they go crazy really quick. Um, but we, we bought a, a Model 5S, which is a uh, uh, egg washer from National Poultry Equipment, uh, which really also helped cut down on handling time, um, got eggs cleaner, faster, with a lot less water and, uh, and labor. Um, all of our birds are free range. We, as I said, we have 1,200 birds. They are all um, rotated around the farm um, in those coops. You saw one, one example uh, where we uh, take them around the farm, move them. We are, they're in about a quarter acre parcel at a time. We're moving them once a week. So it's a real labor uh, management intensive system that we've designed. Um, but the results are really flavorful, distinctive egg at the market. Um, kind of jumping around from, from uh, theme to theme here. But this is just our uh, electric netting. You can see behind, behind me, me there is uh, what we use to contain the birds, which is really easy to move. Um, and a hot fence is the only way to keep out all of your predator friends. Um, all of our brooding is done in a mobile uh, hoop house. We were brooding indoors for the first years as we were getting started and quickly decided that the, the health of the bird, having them on dirt from day one was really what we wanted to be about. Um, and we just, the, the chicks, seem to grow faster, have fewer problems. Um, so this is just a, a hoop house that I built on sleds essentially. So you just back up to it, that small tractor, there's a chain attached to the, to the front and uh, you can pull it forward a coop's length um, and the birds are uh, super happy until they're about two, two months old. Then we'll transfer them to those mobile coops with wheels where they'll kind of live out their days touring the farm. Um, inside this hoop house, it's, it's great because chicks love uh, high temperatures and we have a little hovercraft um, brooder that, that hovers over the chicks, a piece of plywood with uh, some uh, heat lamps in it that helps keep temperatures really solid. And as I said, we, we rarely lose chicks at, at all when we raise them this way. Um, this is, again, a picture of that electric netting. Uh, and the chickens are a great tool that we've kind of are trying to utilize around the farm. Uh, they, they do great in orchards, um, helping keep keep in line. You can see where the, the irrigation is. They'll do a great job doing that. Um, we're, we're not, we don't plant actively plant a ton of pasture for our animals. We're, we're looking for ways to integrate them into our irrigated, like this orchard gets irrigated in the summer. So that's kind of a free source of pasture for us. Um, and in exchange, they're helping maybe reduce pest pressure, add a little more fertility out there to the orchard, um, and uh, making those delicious eggs. We have experimented with growing some of our own feeds. I know this is this talk was kind of focused on feeds, so uh, I haven't really touched on it too much. Uh, most of our food right now, we don't really have the capacity of the equipment to be make, mixing and making all of our own food or the energy just because we're split between so many projects on such a diverse farm. Um, but this has been primarily for our, our hogs that we do feed corn, but we get great yields out of our, our really good, good ground that we have. And I want to start uh, incorporating those into our poultry diets. Uh, we do a a sprouted grain that's kind of just a kind of a fun supplement for the birds. It's not a, a main a main component of their diet, but it's fun to have things out there for them to keep busy while they're out on pasture. Um, so we have we grow about 40 acres of organic heirloom grains every year, which uh, produces quite a few screenings. This is just grain that was had too much trash in it, too much vetch. 
to market. So we end up sprouting that, that grain. It's a two day, just bucket sprouted, pretty simple. Um, and it kind of increase the digestibility of all that stuff. So we kind of a lot of the feed is, is what we have available. Um, but at the core of it is using that, that pre pre-mixed ration from uh, bar ale, which is a local feed company. Um, and they have a certified organic um, laying ration and a chick ration that we use for, for brooding. Um, so this is kind of a, a bigger coop. We kind of scaled up. All of our flocks are isolated um, by age. So we've kind of determined the magic number is 300 per coop, um, which is not a ton of birds. Uh, and it's a lot of work for that number. But um, the birds seem to be happy at that number. Um, and in coop size, we don't really want to be moving a ton of coops because we're moving coops so often. Um, our, our capacity at the farm is 1,200 birds that I'm, I'm not really comfortable going beyond that until we either find more land because um, you don't really want to burn, burn your soil or, or overgraze your pasture because there's not going to be enough, uh, anything there for the birds if you uh, return to this spot. So we'll keep moving that coop forward every couple of days to help disperse the litter, the floors on these coops. Uh, in the winter, we'll put down straw, but most of the time it's uh, an exposed kind of really open air airy environment where the litter just falls right through to the ground um, they're helping clean up around equipment one of one of their many talents that they have uh, predator is predators are one of the like main issues with us so we invested in some of these automatic door closers i think most poultry people pastured poultry producers would tell you you could either get a guard dog uh, or you can go out and close your chickens in every night, which is not something that I really wanted to spend every evening doing. So these are just little battery powered, uh, photo uh, sensitive um, doors that open and close uh, in the morning and the evening. Um, we use a combination of homemade nest boxes and prefab boxes, a simple water tank um, and, and trough uh, water and uh, Yes, I think that's all I have. I'm, I'm really would love to hear questions and um, feel like that's probably the most valuable um, portion of this whole thing. So thanks for having me and I'll be right up front. So before we do questions, so before we do questions, why don't we have uh, Ross come up and uh, if you want to talk a little about your farm, we have some slides. Good evening, I'm Ross with St. John Family Farms in Corning, California, and they're gonna find one other um, set of slides for me too. But to start this, this is our brand new style uh, of egg coop, basically, or chicken coop. We have, uh, we have 18 different types of coops, all with about the same format. However, this year we went and experimented and we were trying portable garages on top of our skids. So this is a, a clean coop, <laughs> no chickens. Um, and then here's just a picture of the chickens outside. Um, everybody heard today Jim talk earlier, and I wanna just emphasize that you'll read all kinds of literature that will tell you that you can save 25 to 30% of your feed costs by putting them in the pasture, zero. Those birds get up in the morning, they eat their feed, they go to work in the pasture, they eat at lunch, take a nap in the afternoon and eat before they go to bed. So don't believe what they tell you. Um, this is inside one of our um, existing coops and we have roofs that we have on both sides of the coops. So we use uh, closet dowel, it's expensive, but the chicken's feet wrap right around it very comfortably. So you'll see people that use two by fours or two by twos, but these really work well for the chickens and they're very comfortable. Um, here's just a picture from farther out. Um, you can see the feeders inside because tonight's kind of a feed discussion. And I don't know, did you find the other email? Can we load that real quick? And, um, so here is our hammer mill. Um, we, I hope everybody can hear because I got to stand and look at the pictures here. Um, we grind our own feed and actually mix our own feed. So our corn comes from California uh, and our soybeans come from Missouri right now. And they'll probably start getting some out of Mich or Minnesota here real soon. So we have a Colorado milling hammer mill that has, this one has a 10 horsepower engine on it or motor. 
when we move to our new feed barn, which is in the other slides, um, we're gonna put the 20 horsepower back on. You know, the one thing you gotta be careful with when you start mixing all your feed is how much you power have you, or how much power you have from Pacific Gas and Electric. And they are going to put their hand out and say, thank you very much. So for the last four years, we've had a generator that has ran our feed mill at our back barn. And we finally have built the new barn and moved it up front. So we're in the process of getting um, everything moved now, but the hammer mill and the mixing machine are still in the back. Can we try putting them in or? Okay, um, so basically it's a free, we use a couple small augers with some gravity to get the um, corn ground. And I'm waiting for pictures if we can get them. Um, I can go back here on our coop. So if you look at the top there, you'll see two kind of bell shaped object hanging. We actually raise our chicks in the coops. We start day one in the pasture in the coops. Those are portable or not portable, but pro propane brooders. So we actually take a big hundred gallon propane tank out to the pasture with the tractor and we can set up anywhere on the property and start our chicks. So we rotate them around. Uh, this was started, this idea came back from a company came to us and said, can you raise the chicks from day one in the field or the pasture? So we came up with this design. So it's kind of handy because we never have to move birds. Everybody starts there and they finish out their livelihood in that um, coop. And something I want to talk about real quick while we're, what, we're uh, waiting for pictures is Last, last time I was here, we talked about economics. And you know, one thing that's important is you gotta make sure when you start doing this, how are you gonna get rid of your birds? You know, that's, that's gonna be a big concern when it gets to the end. So luckily I, I sell most of my birds live. I have a pretty good clientele that follow us. So it's just something to remember, how are you gonna get rid of those birds when it comes time to get rid of them? Are you just gonna euthanize them or are you gonna be able to sell them and we sell them very inexpensively just to get them off the property. So, how are we doing? Oh, yeah. what, what space have you had They're nine and a half inches. Especially since after the yeah. Thanks. Lou, uh, the question was, um, how much space do you have on your roosting birds per bird? And it's uh, nine inches per bird, I think was Ross's answer. So here on the new coops, we'll just go back while we're waiting. We use rollout nest boxes. So the eggs actually roll to the front of the nest boxes and the chickens can't get to them. These are some metal ones that we've tried and we're experimenting with. They seem to work really well. We've also taken and built about 40 of them out of plywood that are a double stacked. And then we have all automatic bell waters throughout. Um, and as we go through this, you know, we start with the satellite water for the chicks. And then as the birds get old, older, we switch waters as we go through it. So at the end, or towards, I should say the end, but when we get to the older hens, we're actually using the turkey waters. We don't use the broiler or laying hen waters. All right, we got more pictures. Yes, switching them out. The question is, is all our floor solid? We actually, we have five by five tube steel on the base, and then we use two by three and one by three cross girders. And then we use a, um, we go to tractor supply and buy no climb fencing to put the initial grid down. And those are actually, what you see in the picture there are were poultry slats. So we have plastic poultry slats on top of that. That's the new one. That's no, actually all our coops have that same floor design. Yes. And that, and that plastic is strong enough to walk on because it has the. Yeah, it's it's about an inch thick. That that those plastic floor slats are what they all the commercial producers use 
in all their buildings when they have slats. So this is our new feed barn. Isn't that the coolest picture? <laughs> and you know what? When we took the picture, it doesn't show up like that through the phone. So that's just, that's the day of our concrete being poured. And that afternoon we had to water it down and that's what we ended up with. So that's my new feed barn. That's too small now before we even got it finished. So, whoops. What's that? At least that one was standing water in your barn. No, no. So here's another picture. So um, Jim didn't really talk about it, but soybeans need to be roasted or processed so that the oil's eliminated from them. And then the elimination is the result of them being heated up. So soybeans need to get between 390 degrees and 320. This is my brand new roasting machine. And as you can see, I built the barn before I knew I was going to buy a roaster. So my roaster has now taken up one whole side of my barn. So I'm excited, but then I don't know what we're going to do because my storage is done. So this um, roaster came from um, or Michigan and it's all electric and it'll do about 10,000 pounds in 24 hours. There's an oil tank in the inside that heats it up. It's all automatic, so basically I got to get up at five o'clock in the morning, and if I ran it the day before, it takes about an hour to heat up. There's a solid auger that runs through the center, and the beans cook as they come through. And I had brought some beans with me, so if you want to taste what roasted soybeans taste like, you can. Oops, wrong one. So tonight's feed night. This is one of our feeders. Uh, this is a patent feeder from Australia. We imported, uh, I think we have 26 of these now. They're one ton feeders. The chickens, this is their style where they hop up on a plank to get to the feed where we've actually eliminated that and the feed's only about four inches off the ground. So we kind of modified what we got in, but the lid lifts up, we have a feed wagon, so we mix into the feed, or fill the wagon and w go around and fill up all the augers. Oops, I'm still going the wrong way. Here is a coal plastic feeder that's supposed to feed 300 chickens a day. Not my favorite. Um, there's issues with it. The L-metal straps in the center don't hold up. The rain shield isn't out far enough. So we use them um, high maintenance at the, after a rainstorm because you gotta go clean all the wet feed out. So not, nothing I would buy again or use. We're real happy with the Australian feeders. I guess that's it. I guess the dogs didn't show up. So just real quick, um, we use guardian dogs. Uh, we have eight of them. Um, we use, a, we have Pyrenees, but our, my favorite now is a Pyrenees Aquash Cross. Um, we've been very happy with them. So we really, all our chickens pretty much have, we've made the decision. You can either isolate each flock or you can open the whole place up. So we've opened the whole place up, but pretty much we have no, we have the flocks far enough apart. So we don't have too much crossover, very minimal because they've all lived in that coop from day one. So that's their home, that's where they go to. And I'm gonna tell you, if you start raising chickens and use portable coops, do not ever move them more than 50 feet at the most in one move. Because their magnetic sensing will take them, if you go too far, they will walk over and eat food that day and they will drink water at that coop. And that night they will go back to the spot they were the night before. And then you get the big fences out in the sectional and you herd them all over to the coop. And it's not fun and there's a lot of words being discussed. So <laughs> any questions? I'm here for feed. I mix my own feed. I've been through it. I can answer a lot of questions for you. Let's come over here. I'm, I'm wondering um, if both of you can kind of walk us through you know, your, your feed 
cost analysis and Ross, how you came to the conclusion that your system of making feed is, is potentially, you know, kind of more cost effective. And then Rye just, you know, you're in, in this boat of, you know, kind of trying to, um, feed a thousand birds and, and that's a real challenge because, you know, the economy of scale and all those type of things. So I'm wondering if you can kind of both, uh, speak to that. Um, I think the first thing I'm going to bring back in the previous discussion was that Jim said, don't, don't go cheap on your feed. And if I think it's in one of his slides, he mentions that it shows, uh, a feed run or something like that. And that means that uh, the mill is adding four or 500 pounds per ton of feed or whatever they want. So there's no quality control on that. So with our feed, um, as I mentioned when I was here two weeks ago, uh, we lost 7,500 birds because the feed wasn't mixed. And you heard him mention stories tonight about, you know, too much salt. It, it happens so quick. So it's, Economically, you lose 7,500 birds. It's not just the initial cost of paying for those chicks, but it's the five months down the road where there was going to be a huge paycheck. It's gone. And you can't go back to the hatchery and buy birds. I mean, that's one thing you're going to learn in this business is if you don't get birds that week, you may not get birds for another month. So you got to be prepared if there's something that goes wrong at the hatchery. But in terms of feed, um, I buy my soy and my corn direct from the farmers, so there's no middleman. Uh, we get the oyster shell from the uh, marine company in Rio Vista. Uh, our premix has been, as Jim said, you know, get a nutritionist. So we have a nutritionist. He's gone through our whole um, premix, is what we call it, which has all our vitamins, minerals, everything we need, and that's made down in Kingsburg, California, for us. And we also mix in olive oil. That's our energy. Um, luckily lots of ollies in our area. So uh, that's what we have. And I, I, can tr I can control the cost very easily. And if we have cold weather or warm weather coming and the birds need more energy, I can add it. Now you guys can add it too if you, for pre-made feed, you just gotta figure out how to mix in the extra oil or add a little corn. But I save a substantial amount of money every year by mixing my own feed. Does it take me a little extra? And have, had, have, I, have I had to go buy a lot of equipment? Yes, but if you're just starting out, I started out with a 60-year-old hammer mill that we rebuilt and Harbor Freight was our best friend because I went to Harbor Freight and bought cement mixers, the orange ones that everybody have seen. And we mixed feed for five years in those. We had five cement mixers running at one time. We just had an assembly line running and we just kept going and we'd dump them and fill up another one. But that's how we got started because buying the mixer and the hammer mill gets to be expensive, but it saves us a ton of money. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, from my personal experience with our birds, at least I feel like, I don't know what the, like the industry standard is in terms of like a conversion for, um, a, poultry ration, but um, I was trying to do a few calculations on the way here. And I think right now we're at like, a, I think it's the way they do it is per 10 birds per week or something like that is, uh, and we're, we're, I think a little bit below from the numbers that I could find. So I, I don't know if it represents 25, maybe 30% reduction, just because I think we are really intensive about where we're moving our birds. Uh, orchards where there's a lot of those high protein things like bugs, um, critters that are crawling around in leaf matter. Uh, we mow our orchard, so it provides a pretty good habitat for bugs. Um, so I haven't really done a lot of the, the hard numbers on it, but I think we are feeding maybe a little bit from what I've at least initially calculated a little bit below that industry standard. And I think it has to do with just moving birds really, really often to new areas because I, as we all know, chickens will only go kind of so far from their house. So we kind of have to bring their house to the, to the feed, to the new feed. Um, so that's just my experience on our farm with, uh, I feel like we have lowered our feed costs a little bit. Um, but I don't really, it's hard without a lot of other farmers to know what people are feeding out per, per bird, uh, per day. So I don't have a lot of those resources, um, to know what, what uh, where we're at on that. And then for like feed mixed,
interesting. It's, it's mostly been a, a scale and a time thing for us. I know we probably could bring down um, our costs a lot, but uh, it's a lack of equipment and a lack of um, management time. We're kind of more on the, the front end of things about trying to get the birds to the best, best pasture at all times. Um, and obviously for a lot of reasons, mostly just uh, organic corn can be coming from Ukraine or China right now and whether or not that's actually organic and false certifications. There's a lot of uh, issues that I have with, uh, you know, the organic grain that we're probably getting in, in our ration, but it's a little bit like we're victims of um, the, the, the agriculture economy here. Why, why aren't more U.S. farmers growing organic um, if there seems to be a pretty good demand for it? So, um, yeah, I, I would love to get in on um, mixing our own feed, but it's, at this point, it's been a pretty hard barrier for us to, to make that extra time commitment. And I don't know what you think of your time is spent mixing feed, um, but it probably will pencil out for you at your scale, right? <laughs> Obviously it does, yeah. Great. So uh, one question for Ross, so a nutritionist is different than a veterinarian. So as a veterinarian, I can attest to the fact that we don't learn very much nutrition. Um, we take a class or two, we're familiar with some of the software, but for the most part, nutritionists are a separate um, kind of career path and people who typically do PhDs in nutrition and every once in a while you get a veterinarian who's a nutrition, but usually they're, they're somewhat exclusive. And um, I, I, I think I, I want to make that point, but I also want to ask Ross if he can kind of walk us through, you know, what the relationship with the nutritionist is like. Um, how, you know, the contract works, how often you're sending samples to them, um, you know, are, is, is, is real, do they really make their, their money on least cost formulation? Um, what, what are you actually paying them to do um, to calculate for you? And, and does it become at some point, does it become a little cookie cutter um, where at some point you, you, can, um, you, can, you can step back a little further because now you've kind of, refined your your feed um, I would say the basically the nutritionist we have we don't I haven't used him for three years because our rations are working so well um, basically I told him what our ingredients were what we wanted to do what we were doing and he put it in the computer and came back with us with six different rations. Uh, the big thing with the nutritionists is they got the amino acids for us. That's, that's what you're gonna find that they need to do. Um, I move things around my, myself. I've been doing it long enough. I add oil, I'll back it off, but we have a starter ration, we have a grower ration, we have a prelay ration, and then we have peak, which is a ration from 17 weeks to 38 weeks, and then we go 38 weeks to 65 weeks, and then 65 weeks until they're gone. So we adjust it, and you know, sometimes what I'll do is if production's down, I'll drop back a feed to give them a boost, give them a little more protein. Um, I can call the nutritionist at any time to, if I have a question, but I really don't have one. We've dialed in you know, so much, you know, it's a pasture operation. So we know the birds are in the field. So the big thing is the methionine is deleted or diluted, I should say. So um, we feed a lot more methionine than will be in a normal ration from a feed mill if you're on pasture. So you gotta be careful with that. So there's some laying issues that could happen there. Uh, other than that, you know, it's, what's hard is finding a nutritionist. It took me a year to find a good one. And he's actually in South Dakota. I've just started calling people. And the thing is, is they're so busy with all the big farmers, they don't have time for the small ones. But I've used Pharrell's for, for uh, premix before. And for a small operation, it'll work for you. It'll be fine. Uh, there's a company in Colorado, Utah, that ships premixes to some of the uh, local feed mills too. So, you know, you start looking around. Um, like I said, I lost a lot of birds and that kind of backed me in the corner and I said, I'm going to do my own feed. So I've got to find all this stuff and I found everything out and I've learned a lot. So that's pretty much, you know, if, if I was starting out, I think I would 
or first recommend that you find for, for Pharrell's premix. The only problem is, is there's not a lot of distributors in, on the West Coast. So that's a problem. Do you buy all of your ingredients? Like a premix, uh, sorry. D but are you buying each ingredient kind of picked apart or are you, there's no premixes involved in your ration? I have everything mixed. So basically my premix has the decal, everything in there. So my hundred pounds of premix will make me one ton of feet. So you have it, you, you, you do it. I have a premix. I have done it the other way. When we first started, we were buying this basic premix and then we do a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And it's like, when I hired the nutritionist, I said, I want one premix, hundred pounds or whatever. I want two 50 pound bags or one 50 pound bag to make a ton of feet. That way the guys, when they mix the feed, there's no mistakes. And so that's what we have. So they put the corn in, the soy in, we know how much oyster shell goes in, the premix and the oil, and I'm done. That's how fast we can mix feed. Yeah, and to that point about premixes that have uh, macro and micronutrients in them, the, the largest commercial poultry operations in the world have premixes too. So it, it's very common. It, it does make the math easier. Um, it makes the formulation a lot easier and it, it just makes a, um, a lot of sense. And uh, while we're still talking about nutritionists, moms and dads that are out there, <clears throat> don't, your kids might want to be veterinarians, so you can encourage them to be veterinarians, but have them focus on nutrition if they really want to make some, some good money and do some international travel. So there are very few nutritionists out there. There are even fewer poultry nutritionists out there. Poultry production is, I think now, um, because of African swine fever, I think it is the largest um, animal producing food animal that we have in the world. Um, so we need poultry veterinarians. We need poultry nutritionists. So um, it's a good career to go into. So anyway, um, you, you know, one question I had for Rye, just kind of staying on this kind of theme of, of you know, kind of just the opportunities that we have in front of us and, and feed. I, I guess I'm curious with your farm and all the different types of residues and crops you have, I mean, is it something that you guys have considered um, you know, kind of starting to dabble in. And I know there's obviously time constraints and, and there's obviously a learning curve there. But I think if anyone's going to do it, you guys would be kind of the perfect place to experiment um, just because of all the different kinds of crops you have. And I'm, I'm wondering if that's just something that's crossed your mind or um, if you can kind of speak to that a little. Um, you, you're still referring to our, making our own feed, right? Yes. Well, yeah, we, so we do have a grain, kind of a grain business, which is only about 50 acres. So on, on uh, industrial scale, where that's like, there's not many people that are even attempting to, to make it work at that scale. But because we're so diversified, it does allow us a little bit of fle flexibility um, in that regard. Um, so over the past five years, we've been working uh, direct with some some, you know, pasta producers, uh, millers. Um, so that has uh, given us some of the equipment that we would need if we wanted to start growing all of our own um, stuff. But again, there's some proteins out there that are really hard to recreate, especially in our climate. Uh, we're going to try planting some some white, uh, uh, like a winter pea this, this year. Um, but again, at the quantities, even with just a thousand birds, um, the land requirements for, to produce those feeds are just kind of out of our scale. Um, so it, yeah, may, maybe if we could find a good grower that we, we could contract with to grow what we would need for a year, um, that would probably be the most viable path for us. Um, and then the next step would be just touching base with somebody who is doing it um, themselves and, and going to see a facility and, and kind of get the hands-on tour of how how we'd need to source some of these uh, micronutrients and premixes where where you know where the the feed do you buy those from a feed mill can you get a bulk you know price price points there and then at the end of the day what's the labor labor involved in all that and is that going to pencil out for us um so yeah i would like to get there um but uh kind of the barriers to entry are still still uh a little beyond my commitment level. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, we have a couple questions. Um, the first one is not nutrition related. Um, you mentioned dogs. Uh, but also, 
uh, this person is having a big problem with hawks. Do you have any suggestions? What kind of hawk? Uh, Red tails. Yeah. Raptors. Can you ask what type of? I'm, I'm if you think hawks are bad, we have golden eagles right now that are uh, about twice the size of a hawk, and uh, they're, they, what, they've kind of caught on to our flock, and there's not a lot we can do, um, with, especially with a, a bird of prey like that that is uh, on, you know, probably on quite a few watch lists. We're not going to go out there and start shooting at it. So we've tried reflective tape, hanging reflective tape, which might work for a hawk too. Um, if you're really desperate, you could try scarecrows or other uh, bird cannons that will will go and sh shoot off at various times of the day. But um, we found with a lot of these birds of prey that after a month, they'll kind of move on, um, uh, that they're not um, interested in sticking around for too long. Uh, hopefully they're not nesting here. <laughs> Can I, I'll, I'll just answer. Um, the red tails are probably, probably is what the problem is. And we have red tails. We actually have a local red tail um, couple that live in the trees south of us and they know their territory we've the dogs well actually I have three dogs that do not like birds and guardians will chase off hawks so every once in a while and it only happens in February we'll lose one or two birds in the far corner and the way I look at it is we lose birds anyway we're just feeding the population we're keeping the raptors alive um, this year we had the bald eagles in early but we didn't lose any birds. They were here, they were in the 1st of December this year, which has never happened. They usually come right about this time. So it's interesting. I think part of it was we had a heavy snow that pushed them out of the mountains to the west of us early. And then they left, they were there for about a week. You know, they sat on the, they sat and looked and I'm sure they were thinking chicken dinner, but we didn't have any problems. But our guardians, um, the three of them just, there's a crow that flies in, anything like that, they're on it. So it's, if you're looking for guardians, find somebody that has one that may have some raptor problems because the parents are gonna teach them a little bit to go bark at the dog or at the birds. Yeah, the, the one thing I'll quickly add to that also is, um, cause we've had, we have a UC Davis uh, pastured poultry farm and um, you know, raptors that they, they, they call them, uh, you know, the, the farmers kind of tax uh, um, that the raptor, whatever, whatever chickens they end up getting. Um, and, and it's a real challenge and they will come back annually. They're very smart and they'll come back and they'll bring their friends. Um, I've heard stories from farmers that, that, to, to, to that point. Um, one of the things we've noticed, if you actually go onto our webpage, we've got the instructions on how to build basically some PVC piped um, covers um, that have uh, shade cloth and PVC pipes that are maybe about a foot or foot and a half off the ground. And when you're out on your pasture or any kind of farm uh, with your chickens, um, they know before you know that there's raptors there and they will, if they're smart, um, they will go um, hide for habitat. So I have noticed that farmers um, don't always provide enough coverage and enough habitat. Um, and it, those PVC um, um, kind of um, shade cloth structures that are maybe four feet by eight feet or so, really easy to move. You can put feeders and waters on there, under them and you can move them throughout your, um, um, your pasture and it allows the birds, they, they will scurry under there, the smart ones, and then there'll be a, a couple kind of nature's taxes there. Sorry, I know Ross wanted to say something else. I don't own stock in Harbor Freight, but Harbor Freight has a 10 foot by 20 foot carport. And if you don't, you just do the first rung high, perfect chicken shades. Yeah, or, or I mean, natural, natural shelters also, you know, in our orchards, we rarely lose any um, birds um, from, from predators like that uh, of the sky. So if, we had a flock out with the golden eagles, especially we were out in the middle of a pasture. We pulled them over to the edge, that picture of them grazing under the equipment, that much cover was enough to really, we haven't lost a bird since. Um, so if you can move the coop over to cover, uh, even natural cover, it will help. And if you're having owl problems, sorry, remember an owl will land and walk in the coop at night and grab them and pull them out. So make sure there's a little height that the, they have, they won't jump up, believe it or not. If they're level, they'll go right in. But if they have to hop up, they won't hop up into the coop. 
yeah, we could do a whole talk on this. And just from, uh, we've done surveys. Number one issue that uh, alternative pastured-based farmers have is number one question they have is predator control. Um, that's number one source of mortality and number one challenge that um, they self-identify. I don't know if it would be helpful or not. I have a friend that has about 1,200 chickens, and she has livestock guardian dogs, but she also has um, some geese, and the geese will actually alert, and then the dogs will run to where the geese are alerting to. And we have another one uh, for Ross. Considering the amount of money you save in producing your own feed, do you think there is an industry waiting to be tapped locally in producing and selling quality, trustworthy, cost-friendly feed for chickens? No. <laughs> um, no, because people are gonna, they're gonna go buy the cheap. Because if you were gonna, buy the feed, it would be more expensive. I mean, my costs, my, I'm buying, I'm not buying cheap feed. I buy the best feed I can get. And so if I went to a feed mill, you know, I, I can buy it by the truckload and afford it, but all these feed mills are bringing corn in by the rail cars. So if I could, if I jump to that level, which we've looked at, it's there, but there's so many people that come and go in this pasture business it, it's not feasible. It's it's not going to happen. You're just going to be stuck with the main players in the game right now. So I had another question. So um, Dr. Hermes kind of touched on some of these, um, I guess I would describe them as alternative feeds, the fermented feeds, for example, which I get a fair amount of questions about. Um, I wonder if you guys could speak to that and also speak to, um, I also get a lot of questions and our lab does a, lot, a decent amount of research with black soldier fly larvae um, as an additional kind of protein source. And there's a lot of small companies that are starting to get involved that are trying to become larger companies that want to displace uh, soy, uh, for example, eventually um, as a protein source um, for uh, food animals using insects. And I'm wondering if you guys could kind of speak to you know, what your sense is of two things. One is, is that feasible uh, in your mind? Um, are there, are you aware of some of these newer kind of designer feeds? And then if you can also speak to kind of what your customers, what they think about that. Is that something that they would see as sustainable, quote unquote? Is it something that they would see as disgusting? Um, you know, the FDA, to their credit, is, is allowing uh, insects, for example, black soldier fly larvae, and I believe uh, tilapia and chickens and maybe salmon now. Uh, farm salmon. So um, it, it is getting kind of fast tracked from a regulatory sense. And, and I'm curious, you know, kind of from a practical sense and also from a kind of a marketing sense, are, are those things that can be kind of, uh, for lack of a better word, exploited by um, producers? <laughs> um, I know the three pastured operations that we're trying to do the larvae and feed the birds and they're no longer in existence. Um, I can call up, place an order, and in five days I have 21 tons of soy that takes me 30 minutes to unload with a forklift. It's, it's just not economically feasible to be raising beetles and everything at my scale or at, in the bigger scales. It, it's not going to be economically feasible in the long term until there's a drastic change or something because everything's so easily grown and available. Um, in terms of customers, um, I don't, we have a few people that ask us to be soy free in that and it's so minute that it's, it's not worth us. I've looked at it, um, we've ran the numbers and it just doesn't pencil out. Um, I find people are more concerned about how the birds are treated and they know if the birds are treated well, they're probably gonna get fed well. And I, I think that's the big thing 
which is more important because, you know, my non-GMO soy has been tested and it doesn't have, you know, GMO in it. But his organic feed's never been tested except for a signature that says it's organic. So what, where, where do you want to draw your lines or start your battles? Um, you know, it's, I have a friend right now that has, he's, he's just started mixing his own feed and he's got soy and corn from out of the country and it's just horrendous looking. It's terrible. And it's certified organic. And you look at the feed I, samples I brought tonight, I mean, you don't have a problem eating it because it looks healthy and his feed just doesn't look healthy. So I, I, you know, it's, people see what's there, but I think they're more concerned about how the birds are raised, but then the price also. Um, yeah, I, a little bit of our thinking is more of the system approach, right? Can we grow more bugs on our farm? Can we have a healthier pasture that we're putting our birds on that we're not going out and buying equipment to, to incubate larva, but we're actually making, uh, bringing bug, more, more life to our farm that, uh, that, that our chickens in turn will be uh, utilizing. So I think it's a little bit of how, how you think of the issue. Um, and so maybe there's, there's other plants out there. I mean, it seems like the whole frontier of, of forages, uh, high protein forages, maybe there's going to be some, some discovery about a plant that in a pasture system will be more digestible for a chicken um, that can replace a lot of these uh, externalized proteins that we bring in for animals. So um, I, I would be more excited to be more on the plant base. How do we harvest sunlight and, and grow plants uh, for our animals that are in turn going to bring more protein in, or, and or maybe change the, bear, the paradigm about how, how proteins react differently in a body uh, or a chicken um, rather than the whole, I mean, all, uh, the whole world of corn and soy has been the, the building block of, of the whole protein or the chicken industry. So I don't know, with our microbiome discoveries that we're making every day and, and the, the biology inside of a chicken might be something that sooner or later will be flipped on its head a little bit. So um, hopefully we can grow it all on our farm eventually someday. <laughs> Any other questions online or? So I wanted to wrap up with just one final question for both of you. So, um, you know, the kind of work that you guys do, you guys have to be so creative, so innovative, and you have so many challenges in front of you every day. And, and I'm wondering just, Right now, what, what, what is, you know, at this point in time, if you guys can just kind of just describe, this is a beginning farmer rancher development program. So USDA defines that as anyone who's farmed 10 years or less. And I'm wondering if you can just describe to the audience, like what's, what's something that, that's keeping you up at night right now? That's a challenge that you're, you're pondering in your head or on your farm. Ross, Ross we, we're only, only a few minutes. Okay, we can't go on for like an hour here. <laughs> What's keeping me up at night right now is the new ambulance in Corning that has a new frequency that makes the dogs howl. It's terrible. Um, I think the biggest thing is a lot of the manufacturers we're dealing with right now are starting to cut out the little guys, um, egg cartons that we order. You know, now it's basically a half a load you have to buy. You used to be able to buy 20,000 and you still can, but you got to find somebody to buy that big load on the other side and I'm kind of the big guy now on the other side of the load. Um, it's just little things like that that are, you know, changing. You see more, you know, they, it's buy more, buy more, buy more. Um, but not really a lot. I mean, the state's great to work with. We've had the FDA in for, um, audits and you know they're great people i mean we've had no problem you, you take care of your paperwork you do everything you're supposed to and it's an easy audit you know and and a lot of the inspectors you know we're on first name basis and get along with them and um you know you just treat them with the respect and they'll give you the respect but in terms of you know it's, it's probably just weather right now <laughs> um that's probably my biggest concern uh, we've seen our flocks move a whole month ahead we used to production would drop in June and now production drops in May. And we, we've definitely seen that in the heat. Um, and the fires, you know, the smoke doesn't help the birds. We've had uh, the last, knock on wood this last summer, we didn't have any major fires in our area, but the year before we had three 
fires within as the crow flies, not the chicken, the crow, uh, within, you know, 40 miles of us. So we were, it didn't matter which way the wind blew. There for a while, if it blew from the south, we get the fire from the south in Lake County. If it blew from the north, we get the fire from the Reading area. So we were just basically in this fog the whole time. And our production shows it, but who do you go to and say, hey, PG&E, are you going to pay for my chickens? It didn't. No, you don't get that. So um, the environment's definitely changing. Um, it's changed. And, you know, I, I call it climate change, not global, global warming. Because you know what, I've been out a few days here the last couple of weeks and it's been cold. So it's not getting that warm. Um, but that, that's a concern, the, the smoke and how the climate's changed and how we have to adjust it. That's a concern. Um, yeah, to, to go right into the climate change. I mean, we're, I feel like my generation is getting into a farming at a whole another time of our, uh, World's, world's changing, our political uh, climate is changing, um, and our physical climate changing, and, and agriculture, it's known, is responsible for, what, 40% of most of the greenhouse, excess greenhouse uh, gases that have been, you know, it's not cars, it's agriculture that's the main culprit for a lot of, um, lot of, lot of climate change. Um, and I think we have a pretty broken agriculture system, um, and I'd like to see um, farmers change the way they, they farm, using more cover crops, harvesting, harvesting that carbon, and, and being a part of agriculture being a solution to time, climate change is something that I'm hopeful for. Um, and, you know, I was just at a fun conference down in Monterey, and there's a lot of cool farmers doing a lot of um, really innovative stuff, and a lot of it's throwing out a little bit of the conventional um, playbook when it comes to t tilling soil, um, all the all the CO2 that that is released when that happens. Um, and so I'm not just focused on poultry on my farm, so that's why my head is spinning a little bit because I'm I, I work in a lot of the worlds. But uh, one of the the most inspiring things was was hearing some of these farmers who are doing no till or, or low till farming, um, and getting you know the same amount of yields we can we can feed the world and fix the climate at the same time in agriculture, which is pretty inspiring to be a part of that. So yeah. Great. Well, with that, um, why don't we wrap up and um, just a plug for our talk on Thursday. So um, that's our last of these Zoom enabled kind of workshops. We'll have more um, workshops throughout the state for the rest of the year and beyond. But uh, on Thursday will be our last workshop that's Zoom enabled. And um, all these Zoom enabled workshops will also be um, uploaded onto YouTube, onto our channel, our YouTube channel. So um, hopefully you guys, if you haven't been able to see all of them, you can go there um, and uh, view them there whenever you have some time. So with that, yeah, and feel free to subscribe. We have uh, 11 people now subscribed. So we're hoping to boost that up a little. We were at three about a month ago. So <laughs> um, with that, um, thank you everyone. Drive safely and uh, thanks for spending uh, your Monday night with us. Good night.